we are going to look on a topic that is a very crucial one and very important in our generation. And I believe once we are able to look into God's word that brings forth understanding for us, we'll be able to leave out what the Bible says. Just like living epistles, letters that can be read by our neighbors, by our colleagues, uh, by our clients, by our employees, and employers as well. And so I'm challenging us uh, today that let's open up our spirit. Let's see what God will really incline in our hearts and what it will minister to us. Of course, both both corporately and also individual as well. And my prayer always is that we may live to fulfill God's purpose. Not our own purposes, but God's purpose. Because that is why he created us. To live only and only for him. And so a question arises. Who is the man of God? Who is the woman of God? How can we say you are a man of God? You are a woman of God. Because we've had all this wherever we are, uh, wherever we live, or the churches that we go into, and they're sort of key people that are being called men and women of God, yet the others are not being, you know, they're just brothers and sisters in Christ. But I wanted just to go through scriptures that will help us identify this and uh, position us in a place of knowing that actually the man of God and the woman of God we perceive to be you are that woman of God you are that man of God and what a privilege that God has given to you and I not only to serve him but to minister to him on a daily basis and so what is a man of God really like how do men who believe in Jesus become more like Jesus? How do women who believe in Jesus become more like Jesus? And it takes us to a scripture here that many of us know. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 to 10. And also we look verse 12 to 14 and verse 16. It says, But have nothing to do with irreverent folklore and silly myths. So we are already seeing one quality here, a person who has nothing to do with irreverent folklore. Similarly, on the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, keeping yourself spiritually fit. The reason why we look to the word of God, the reason why we come forth in prayer, the, the reason why we, we worship God in songs and praise thanksgiving is because it's a disciplined life we want to live a disciplined life of godliness of purpose and it helps us to be trained spiritually it says for physical training is of some value but godliness spiritual training is of value in everything in and in every way since it holds promise for the present life and for the life to come. This is a faithful and trustworthy saying, worthy of full acceptance and approval. It is for this that we labor and strive. Awesome. That is often called to account because we have fixed our confident hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those. Who believe? Who believe what? Those who believe in him. Those who recognize him as the son of God and accept him as the savior and Lord. So when, come, when someone comes to you and asks you, are you a believer? We have believers of different things. Of, I mean, people believe in witchcraft. People believe in reading of, you know, the palms of their hands and they're able to just they believe in divination they believe in all things but i'm talking about people believe and put their faith in christ jesus it, and how can we be able to you know look at ourselves self 
introspection. He says, people who believe in Jesus, who recognize him as the son of God, not only believe in him, but recognize him as the son of God, and doesn't stop there, and accept him as savior and Lord. Not only savior here, but Lord. Yes, I believe he served me, but he is he Lord of your life. Every aspect, every facet of your life. Saying, let no one look down on you because of your youth, but be an example and set a pattern for the believers in speech. So, having received Christ, we have to set a pattern. It doesn't just stop there like, all right, ah, I have Christ. He has me, and that's it. No, the Bible says we need to set a pattern. Set a pattern in what? Set a pattern in our speech, how we speak, in our conduct. And this is allowing the Holy Spirit to work really in your life, to work really in my life. If, I mean, if I allow him to work. If I don't, then I just remain there. I remain lethargic spiritually. But it says, in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in moral purity. This is a very sensitive one. And I know that most of us need to hear this. We are living in an immoral world. Whereby people do whatever pleases them. And they profess to be Christian. Which is totally not in accordance to what the scriptures say. There has to be moral uprightness. Moral purity. And Paul says, until I come, he's urging, you know, the protege, Timothy here, devote yourself to public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching the sound doctrine of God's word. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, that special endowment which was intentionally bestowed on you by the Holy Spirit. Through prophetic utterance, when the elders lay their hands on you, at your ordination. Pay close attention to yourself. Concentrate on your personal development. No one will help you. It's a choice. You have to be intentional for your personal development and to your teaching. Persevere in this thing. That is, hold to them. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. So it's not just about us. People will look at our lives and people that God opposes around us. If you married your wife, if you married your husband, if you've got children, your children, your parents, your parents-in-law, your colleagues, your neighbors, your clients, your I mean, classmates, name it. So what does it mean for a man to set an example in his conduct? As we've read the scripture, what does it mean? It's an intentionally broad, all-encompassing term in scripture. And of course, it's often paired with a speech in Romans chapter 15, verse 18 to 19. That A says, For I will not even presume to speak of any, anything except what Christ has done through me as an instrument in his hands, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles to the gospel by word and deed, with the power of signs and wonders, and all of it in the power of the Spirit. So that's what Paul says. Setting an example in our conduct, not boasting in anything, but on Christ, who has chosen you, who has chosen me to be an instrument in his hands. You see, that's how we set an example. That's how we set, uh, that's how we set an example in our conduct, not boasting anything, but in Christ, everything centered on Christ. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, 17. So before that, he says, conduct himself in his word, in his deed, 
and it's mentioning here more, all this he says there's those word there is deed there is power of signs and wonders and all of it is, is the power of the spirit holy spirit being in control so you can only operate in signs and wonders and there is no deed and there is no word. All these have to really balance. They have to be together. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 of 17. So as God's own chosen people who are holy, you as a God chosen person, you're set apart, sanctified. For what? Not for your purpose. Set apart for his purpose and well beloved by God himself. Put on heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. These are the fruit of spirit, which has the power to endure whatever injustice or unpleasantness comes with good temper. Endure all form of injustice with what? With good temper. Bearing graciously with one another and willingly forgiving each other. If one has a cause for complaint against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so should you forgive. Beyond all these things, put on and wrap yourselves in an unselfish love, which is the perfect bond of unity, for everything is bound together in agreement. When each one seeks the best for others, let the peace of Christ the inner calm of one who walks daily with him. Be the controlling factor in your hearts. Deciding and settling questions that arise. To this peace indeed you are called as member in one body of believers. And be thankful to God always. Let the spoken word of Christ have its home <laughs> within you. Dwelling in your heart and your mind, permeating every aspect of your being. As you do what? As you teach. So as I teach, I'm allowing the word of God to have its home in my heart and in my mind and you as well. The word of God is a double-edged sword. As it cuts through you, it cuts through me as well. As you teach spiritual things and admonish and train one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, no matter what it is, mention here right, another thing. How do we set example in our conduct? In word or deed? Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus and in, de and in dependence on Him, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So, what we say and what we do, when it comes to our conduct, we might ask, what does the way we live say about Jesus? What does the way you live say about Jesus? What does the way I live say about Jesus? What kinds of conclusion will people draw about our Lord after watching me closely? After watching you closely? For a day, <laughs> when you sit with that person in an aeroplane, in the bus, in a, in a van, when you invite them in your house, when you visit their house, when you're there in the office for a day, for a week, or a month, or for years, or a decade, what kind of conclusion would they draw about Jesus in you? You know, we know perfect, but that challenges us every morning when we wake up. We look to the Lord. Lord, cause me to be a blessing upon the people that you bring on my way today. Let me live for your glory. Let me live for your purpose. Let the Holy Spirit lead and guide me every single day. And then the Lord is awesome. That we are not reliant on ourselves. It says, doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus and in dependence on Him totally dependent on the Lord to do this willingly allow ourselves for him to use us so there are key things here that we need to have 
to be able to flesh out the man of God or the woman of God that God has called us. And number one is to have a remarkable, exceptional lifestyle. Remarkable, exceptional lifestyle. It seems very hard. And that's why we can do all things through Christ to strengthen us. When we allow the Holy Spirit, when we don't set a standard for ourselves, but of God, God has set it for us so that we can come to Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit to help us. And that means on a daily basis we look to Him for us to be able to achieve this remarkable, exceptional lifestyle. So in one sense, most of Paul's letters address our conduct, directly or in, indirectly. And in the immediate context of 1 Timothy, for the elder qualification in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, name and unpack some critical qualities of a godly man, including his conduct. While the qualifications are given for aspiring elders, of course, when you talk about that, most people use it when leaders are being ordained or are being appointed or prayed for. They are not ex exclusive to only these people, except perhaps for the ability to teach. And even with the teaching, however, every man should aspire to handle God's word faithfully, so long as you are in the fold, you're part and parcel of God's kingdom. And you're serving his purposes with accuracy and care. So the qualities in the qualification are simply what every Christian man should strive to be. Every Christian woman should strive to be. And several of them speak specifically to how we live. <laughs> yeah, how we live. The word that Paul uses for conduct also shows up a number of times in the Apostles Peter's letters much more than in Paul, which is amazing. So they are complementing each other, which is a great thing. So we might also look to Peter to understand more fully what Paul charged Timothy and us to be and do. So between the elders' qualifications and Peter's instruction, we can isolate some specific ways men who believe in God become greater. And they become true men and women of God in their conduct. We can become men and women of God in our conduct. So the list of qualities in, is not exhaustive, what I want to just share here. But it gives men and women specific spiritual qualities to pursue. So when you're talking about remarkable exceptional lifestyle, number one is we are supposed to be men who are set apart from the world. So when you look at a person and you are able to point, are, are, they, ma, are they men? You can look to people and, and you can attest that they are men, they are women of God. One of the things that can easily come of them is like they are set apart from the world. Are you set apart from the world? Am I set apart from the world? In First Peter 4, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 14 to 16 says, Live as obedient children of God. First someone says, obedience is better than sacrifice. God does not delight in bad sacrifice and offerings. They delight in a contrite, broken spirit, a contrite heart. He takes delight in that. And that's what is so in David. And that's why God says, this is a man after my own heart. There's a brokenness, there's contrariness within. Not just sacrifices, not just burnt offerings. No. In fact, the Bible, when it talks about sacrifice, talks about the sacrifice of thanksgiving, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to God. So it's a matter of exalting, acknowledging, you know, proclaiming and living. Obedience. To God. Do not be conformed to the evil desires which govern you in your ignorance. So it talks about when we were still there and have not 
come into the fold. There was an ignorance before we knew the requirements and transforming power of the good news regarding salvation. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in your conduct. That's why it says, the one who called us is holy. And so, be holy in our conduct. I know most of this is not preached mostly. Very few do this. And if people are there and preaching, we thank God for that. That we may be holy in our conduct. We may be set apart from the world by our godly character and our moral courage. So you know, just godly character, but also there has to be moral courage. Because it is written, you shall be holy, you shall be set apart. For I am holy. Exactly. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. Jesus said, I pray that you do not take them out of this world. John 17. But keep them from the evil one. That's the prayer that Jesus made for you and I. Be kept. So they strive to conform their conduct and all of their conduct to the conduct of Christ. That's what we are being driven to. Conform to our conduct. Or know the conduct to conduct of Christ. Romans 8 29. For those whom we foreknew and loved and chose beforehand, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Ultimate share in his complete sanctification. So that he will be the first one, the most beloved and honored among many believers. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will vanish with a mighty thunderous roar, and the material elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and the wax that are on it will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, together, what kind of people ought you to be in the meantime? In holy behavior, that is, in a pattern of daily life that sets you apart as a believer. And in godliness, that is, displaying profound reverence toward our awesome God. While you honestly look for and await the coming of the day of our God. For on this day, the heaven will be destroyed by burning and the material elements will melt with intense heat. But... In accordance with his promise, we expect, expectantly wait new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, beloved, since you are looking forward to these things, since you are looking forward to these things, since I'm looking forward to these things, be diligent and make every effort to be found by him at his return, you know, spotless and blameless. Yes, that's what God is out with, spotless and blameless. And that's why when we wake up, we can't say, do not see him. We know whoever say that he has not seen is a lie. The truth is not found in him. When we confess his righteousness, and he's able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so whenever we the standard has been set up as set for us, we go back to Christ. He just tells us that how short we always fall towards the glory of God. And that makes us to always see Christ, always pursue him fully to live this life of spotless and blameless, not just after receiving Christ, you just say, no, we have to pursue him. As you receive Christ, so ye walk in him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Rooted, built up in the most holy faith, established in the faith, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So it's about walking in him. After receiving him, walking in him. So, Found by him, spotless and blameless, in peace that is inwardly come with a sense of spiritual well-being and confidence, having lived 
a life of obedience to Him. Still obedience comes here. Having lived a life of obedience to who? To Christ. He tells you to obey His laws and His commands, which are not bad and sound. You found, you found there. Therefore, let me warn you, Peter is now telling us, let me warn you, beloved, knowing these things beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men. The men will distort doctrine. Don't be carried away by men who distort doctrine. And that's my prayer. May Jesus of course, his light has released it, shining in your life. And you may not be carried away by the error of men who distort doctrine. And fall from your own steadfastness. The steadfastness of mind, knowledge, truth, and faith. But grow spiritually mature. <laughs> In the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, honor, majesty, and splendor, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Yeah. So, in light of who Jesus really is and the reality that He is coming again, what sort of man should we be? What sort of man should we be? The light of who Jesus really is. And the reality that he is coming back again. We are supposed to be holy men. Holy women. Set apart. Temptation defying men. Sin crucifying men. Not self-righteous men. Just get this. Not self-righteous men, but humble men who long to live like Jesus. Hallelujah. Just to live for you, Lord. Just to live for you, Lord Jesus. Just to live for you. Simple. Not to live for myself, not to live for others, but just to live for Him. That's it. Live for God. Live for God. Woo. So we have to be men of self control. Let us. Uh, to men of self-control, women of self-control. In this generation we are in, that our body craves of everything here and there. You know, I want this, I want this, I want to live like the others. But we ought to be men and women of self-control. Pursuing holiness will mean developing self-control. When we're pursuing holiness, that will be the fruit of the spirit of self-control. Titus chapter 2 verse 1 to 8 says, But as for you, teach the things which are in agreement with the sound doctrine, which produces men and women of good character. So sound doctrines produces men and women of good character. Wrong doctrine produces the other one, men and women of immoral character. Whose lifestyle identify them as true Christians. When that is sound doctrine, your lifestyle identify you as a true Christian. Other men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in steadfastness, Christ like in character. All the women, similar, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor addicted to much wine. <laughs> Teaching what is right and good so that they may encourage the young women to tenderly love their husbands and their children to be sensible, pure, makers of a home where God is honored. Unfortunately, we don't, we have the remnant, I believe so, few women who are makers of their home, even who profess to be believers. They are full of gossips. They are addicted. They are not teaching what is right and good. 
But once they do, when they are encouraging others and they are, make, they are homemakers, they are able to encourage the young women to tenderly love their husband and their children, to be sensible, pure makers of a home where God is honored. Good nature, being subject to their own husband so that the word of God will not be dishonored. The reason why the word of God is being dishonored is because young women have chosen to dishonor their husband. That's what the Bible says, not someone saying here. They're not loving their hands and tenderly. They're not subjected to their own husband. In fact, some people are unfortunate. Women honor, <laughs> oh my, they honor their pastors. They're more subjected to their pastors, actually, than their own husbands. That's a lie. Come on. are supposed to be subjected to your own husband so that the word of God will not be dishonored in a similar way I urge the young men to be sensible and self-controlled and to behave wisely that is taking life seriously and in all things show yourself to be an example of good works with purity in doctrine See, you're mentioning doctrine here because that's where the rubber meets the road, where that's where we can make the right decision that will make our lives to truly live for God. Having the strictest regard for integrity and truth, dignified, sound, and beyond reproach in instruction, so that the opponent of the faith, why? Proper doctrine, so that the opening of the faith will be shamed, having nothing but to say about us. So it's not just I'll leave. No. People look at your life as a believer. People look at your life. People look at my life as a believer. So, but given what God expects of heads of households, talking about people who are married and you know, in a family of their own. It also talks about the shepherds in the church. The cultivation of self-control is a particular is of particular importance for the shepherd, for man and woman in the house, for a shepherd that is shepherding God's sheep, the great chief shepherd. Chief shepherd. Ten twist there. Exactly. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 to 7. Now an overseer must be blameless and beyond reproach. We know this one, we normally mention it as well as we pray for leaders to appoint them. The husband of one wife, self controlled, <laughs> mentioning the word self controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, not a bully nor quick-tempered and hot-headed, but gentle and considerate, free from the love of money. It qualifies that, free from the love of money, that is not greedy for wealth, and its inherent power financially, that is your financially ethical. He must manage his household well. Keeping his children under control with all dignity. That is keeping them respectful and well behaved. For if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And he must not be a new convert. We've seen in this generation, a guy gets born again. He used to play secular music. He was a non-believer, and then it gets converted to the tomorrow is being given position in, in church to lead worship. Come on, it's not scriptural. Person gets saved right today, and then a few weeks is a pastor. Come on, who are we lying to? The word of God tells us he must not be a new convert. There is a reason why he should not be a new convert. 
And look at any man of God in the scripture. When God called them, that was a training. <laughs> they are to go through. The reason here is that so that they will not behave stupidly and become conceited by appointment to this high office and fall into the same condemnation incurred by the devil for his arrogance and pride. Protect the person from arrogance and pride because that's the spirit of Lucifer that we see here. And you must have a good reputation and be well thought of by those outside the church so that he will not be discredited and fall into the devil's trap. That's the reason why he should not be a new convert. He should not be a new convert. He should not be a new convert. First Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8. For this is the will of God that you be sanctified you be separated and set apart from sin. So sanctification that the work of the Holy Spirit is doing is to set us apart from sin. And you abstain and back away from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Being available for God's purpose and separated from things profane. Not to be used in lustful passion. Like the Gentiles who do not know God and are ignorant of his will. And that in this matter of sexual misconduct, no man shall transgress and defraud his brother because the Lord is the avenger in all his things. Just as we have told you before and solemnly warn you. For God has not called us to impurity, yes, but to holiness, to be dedicated and set apart by the behavior that pleases him whether in public or in private. Amen. So whoever rejects, listen, listen, and this is a warning from the Bible, from the scripture. Whoever rejects and disregard this is not merely rejecting man, <laughs> but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you to dwell in you and empower, and empower you to overcome temptation. So you're not rejecting man, but rejecting the Holy Spirit. Rejecting God who has given the Holy Spirit to you, to dwell in you, empower you to overcome temptation. If you want our conduct to magnify the work of our Savior, we have to learn how to control unholy and dishonorable impulses within us. We have to learn. We are continually learning. We have to learn. And not just with our bodies, but with our time, our spending, even our attention. <laughs> attention span in this generation is short but our guy just takes a long time when we are hearing the word of God or worshiping our attention span is short it's hard it's a sad it's a sad sad time that we live in but we can we can pick we can pick to an entirely Learn how to control unholy and dishonorable impulses within us. That is growing in godliness. Meaning, and that, that will mean regularly saying no and often to good things. Yes, there may be good things, but not the only best. That's why Romans says, Be not be conformed to the patterns and the systems of this world, but be ye transformed by renewing your mind, that you may be able to know that which is good, acceptable, perfect. So we're not only sending on good, but acceptable and perfect. That is the will of God for you and I as a believer. 
Second Peter chapter one. As I wind up the first part of it. Five to eleven. For this very reason, applying our diligence to the divine promises, make every effort. Make every effort. Still it grows to you as a believer. Make every effort in exercising your faith to develop moral excellence. And in moral excellence, knowledge that is insight, understanding. And in your knowledge, so first of all, here I see every effort in exercising our faith to develop moral excellence. And in moral excellence, knowledge that is insight, understanding. And in our knowledge, self control, because too much knowledge pumps up. So there has to be this, the fruit of the spirit of self-control. And in your self-control, steadfastness, meaning you're not compromising. Steadfastness. And in your steadfastness, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly affection. And in your brotherly affection, that is develop Christian love, that is learn to unselfishly seek the best for others and to do things for their benefit. For as these qualities are yours are increasing in you as you grow towards spiritual maturity, they will keep you. <laughs> they will keep me, they will keep you from being useless and unproductive in regard to the true knowledge and greater understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to be productive, you want not to be useless. Let this be found. Let this be guided to keep you. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, short-sighted, closing his spiritual eyes to the truth, having become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, believers, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling, not my calling, God's calling. Be, the Bible says here, make certain about his calling. Be more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. He chose you. He chose me. Be sure that your behavior reflects and confirms your relationship with God. For by doing so, by doing these things again, he emphasizes here, he emphasizes here. Actively developing these virtues, you will never stumble. That's the truth. And the Bible says you'll never, you will never, you'll never stumble in your spiritual growth and will live a life that leads others away from sin. So it's not only your life, but others as well. You will live a life that leads others away from sin when they look to your life. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly provided to you. Amen. Amen. So we've looked at, we are supposed to be a man of self-control, the fruit of the Spirit self-control in our lives. That will point us to be men and women of God. So it's not about a person who stands there on the pulpit, an apostle, like, it's not about an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor or a teacher. It's you who is a believer in Christ, who totally rely on Jesus Christ. You know him, you believe in him, you obey him. When you do this, you're a man of God. You're a woman of God. So be like a man of God. Be like a woman of God. Act like a man of God. Act like a woman of God. By clothing yourself with this. Of course, with all humility. So I've spoken about being set apart from the world. 
and that qualifies exceptional, remarkable lifestyle. When you sit apart from the world, it is through self-control. It's a key factor here. Key factor. So next we'll look on where do you need to grow in self-control? Where do I need to grow in self-control? What do I struggle to say no to? Even when I know I should.